Okay, good afternoon. Would you believe it? It's already week three of the semester. Time flies. Beautiful day outside. This is the plan for the week. We are going to look at the first work of fiction for our class and one of the most significant in the earliest phase of the representation of the automobile. Charles Loomis wrote three short stories on the automobile, which he later collected and printed as a book. But they're from 1900, 1901, 1902. Before, even though automobiles were circulating, were being used during the 1890s, you don't find a lot of texts of fiction about the automobile. You find, of course, technical texts. And overall, the interest in the automobile was limited. And even in the press, when they talked about the automobile, people buying automobiles, people going out for rides, doing automobiling, doing motoring, it's interesting the angle they placed on that. Do you know where they classify the activity of going on an automobile within human activities? Any guess? It's a very different kind of classification in terms of the taxonomy of social activities compared to how we view automobiles, cars today. Any guesses? Clearly, what I'm getting at is that it wasn't classified under transportation. No. Transportation, if done reliably, had to be done with other means, right? I was going to say, was it like play to them? Was it like Close. Close. It was a pastime, but it was placed within the area of other ways to other pastimes, specifically which ones? It was considered a sport. It was considered a sport because the emphasis was on the physical activities involved in riding on an automobile or driving the automobile. Because you really had to be able to tolerate the speed, exercise your breathing because you were on an open top car speeding and the idea was that you had to actively breathe in order to capture the air that was coming at you and going away from you at speed. So automobiling was grouped together with tennis, horse riding, badminton, anything that the upper classes were practicing as sports during that time. The 1900s, then the conversation about the automobile takes a uh, different path and becomes more interesting. And we will see what's the significance of the fictions, fiction stories by Loomis is I titled it Captive to the Technology because all three stories have this in common. They're about the loss of control. The technology taking over your life. I included in this week's section page also a link to a, an interesting illustrated book uh, in French. It's not required reading. It's for your curiosity. Uh, Many texts were published during the first 10, 12 years of the 20th century about children and cars or children literature with animals, for example, uh, driving cars. We're not going to go into that, but I thought I would widen the horizons and include something different. The film will be watching scenes from this week and the next is a wonderful film. In a way, it is closely connected to Herbie. Bumblebee, 
from 2019 is one of the best in the Transformers series together with the first and the second film didn't much like the last one for example very formulaic very templated Bumblebee in fact could be a standalone film you don't really have to have seen the previous films in the series to appreciate the film and I said uh, it is connected to Herbie to the love bag and the Herbie series of movies because in this film a female female high school student finds a yellow beetle and starts restoring uh, working on this car unbeknownst to her the yellow beetle is in fact a transformer who has found refuge on earth and who was hit in a fight between different androids and uh, therefore transformed into a car but couldn't change back into its robotic form. Through their newly established relationship, Charlie and B127, nicknamed Bumblebee, will each find their strengths, ways to build their identity and get to the other side and uh, become mature, become full-fledged members of their own communities and, and therefore get to their futures. Very nicely directed and acted as well. A few announcements just to start. I added to your Google Docs the grades and sometimes comments for the notes you took during the first uh, sequence of scenes from the love bug. I don't find it necessary to, for, for a few notes, exactly say B minus or A or C plus. And therefore what you will find is next to uh, the title of the notes in your Google Doc will be excellent, very good, good or adequate. And these are the ranges. Sometimes I did add comments if I thought the comments were significant, such as try not to be so descriptive or try not to include just your reaction to the film, try to read or interpret the film, etc. And of course, if there are no comments and you would like comments, if there are comments and you, you think they're too cryptic, just let me know. Email me, come and see me in my office and we can talk about your notes. And of course, I'll proceed and do the same with the next set of notes. I also reviewed and graded all the copies of the first assignments assignment which was due last Friday and left comments, grades. If you find several comments next to the text, because I wanted to comment specifically on a passage, once you've read those comments, feel free to complete them and send them away. Just please leave the comment with the grade. Nothing happens if you delete that because it can be retrieved and also because clearly I have copied the comment with the grade, but it's easier if you look at your Google Doc and how you did during the semester or if I did do so myself, it's easier to have a sense of your progress or lack thereof. You find here a mention of the third lecture's video, but in fact, even the fourth has a video. It's just that from now on, I will not be posting announcements every time I post a video of a lecture. You know that usually the next day, worst case scenario, by the end of the week, every lecture uh, has a video in case you miss a class. And of course, if you added to the class during the uh, last few days after Thursday, 
please do, go find those videos, watch, and then come to me with questions. This is where you normally find the videos. In the lectures and readings page, there is one page assigned to each week. And inside that page, every time, you find sections with YouTube videos from different semesters. I've included past semesters as well, because sometimes I can refer to them and say, as I've done in week two, if you want to have a detailed overview of this presentation, go to last year. And this year, I only focused on two or three of the main concepts. And inside the page itself, you will find the videos embedded. But then, of course, you can watch them on YouTube if you prefer, or you can go straight to YouTube and look for my handle, which is Dr. Andrea Fedi, SBU. Sunday, the forecast is good weather, sun. So if you're around, if you live on campus, if you're uh, close to the campus, come and see the Concorso. We have more than 50 between vehicles and motorcycles, all Italian or with Italian parts. We accept cars with an Italian engine or more often with an Italian body, such as this American car with a body designed by Ghia. Because throughout the 20th century, from the very beginning, the early 1900s, through the, 1960, the 1960s, by all means, but also 70s and 80s, there was still uh, the practice in the industry to have the bodies of some luxury or sports vehicle made by different body makers. So that in a case such as this and future cases, the Cadillac Alante, which is represented in our um, display of cars on Sunday, cars, the chassis and the engine would be shipped to Italy where uh, um, the body would be installed and the car would be shipped back to the US. And this was done for small numbers, but small numbers often was hundreds or thousands. And as I said, it, this kind of practice goes back to the earliest part of the 20th century when a lot of the cars, especially car makers in Europe, provided engines and chassis, but then the customers, especially the wealthiest customers, went to body makers to have a customized body installed on the car. And some car makers were just assemblers, right? So they just got the body, the, the chassis, and put everything together without a unique project or design. Before we talk about Charles Loomis short stories. I want to go back to this introductory presentation just to insist, let you understand that there are important ideas in here and I just want to focus on a few of them and then you can review. It's a reading, it's a required reading so you can review everything yourself. These are some of the core concepts and in here you find also the kind of terminology that you're supposed to use in assignments, if relevant, in the final exam, for sure. So what is a technology? Basic definition of a technology. It's a device or an apparatus that gives you an advantage, that potentiate your actions, and that has the following characteristics. It has at least one practical or utilitarian function. It is developed, not found. And after it is first invented, it can be further enhanced. So there is an arc of development where the technology is developed, perfected, and then it can plateau, it can even... Uh, fall out of fashion, not be used any longer, or uh, a technology can be forgotten. There are societies from the past where technologies were used 
and then forgotten when with the fall of the Roman Empire, for example, a lot of the technologies that the Romans were familiar with were lost to European societies and were rediscovered later on after the year 1000, for example. So take a big lift used to protect oneself from the rain. That is not a technology because it's found, right? It's not made. However, if you take several leaves and you weave them together and perhaps you add a stick to build a rudimentary umbrella, that's a technology. And clearly it can be perfected too. Modern umbrellas, which date to the 18th century, and then you can find minimal improvements up to uh, today, right? Pocketable umbrellas, etc. Because otherwise, if you limit your use of this device, the leaf to protect from water, to finding the leaf, put it on your head, then even a primate could do it. And there are several examples of this nature. Now, we are dealing with the automobile, which is both a modern technology in terms of its representation and a personal technology. By personal or individual technology, I'm not referring just to the personal use of the device or apparatus. I'm referring to the fact, using the base word for personal, which is persona, from the Etruscan, the mask, the identity that you project to your community, a kind of technology that can be used to build or construct your identity or can support that kind of process of identity building and construction. What are the features typical in a modern individual or personal technology? There is one or more utilitarian practical functions. However, there is also usually at least one redundant overlapping or superfluous function. I'll show you some examples in a moment. And there can be immaterial qualities or features in this technology that were not necessarily intended from the very beginning, but emerged through the socialization of the adoption of the technology itself. So let's look at something simple that goes back to the past as well. Fashion, clothes, even clothes are a technology, right? The utilitarian function, the primary function for clothes is to keep you warm, to cover you, to keep you cool. If you use clothes to insulate from excessive heat outside, that's clear. However, there is also a clear superfluous, a set of superfluous functions, right? You can accessorize your clothes. You can color your clothes. You can have fabric with printed designs. You can have on yourself or in your closet more clothes that you need. So the use goes beyond the necessities of the primary function, right? And that is what is true for the past for clothes is even more true now, right? Even members of the middle class 300 years ago would wear and use the same dress for three, five, seven years. We have anecdotal evidence from journals, right? Those clothes would get repaired. They, other than the wealthiest elites, people wouldn't have as many items of clothing as anyone here has in their closet. Immaterial functions for clothing, clearly the clothing identifies you within your community, right? You go from the uniform of a cop, right? Identifying the cop as a representative of the authority to the ways you can communicate that you belong to a certain group through your clothing, right? Take high school. I'm a goth or I'm a member of another group and I communicate that through my clothing. Immaterial qualities, again, you can use clothing to communicate, right? For example, you communicate your mood. Uh, I'm in a good mood and, and my clothes reflect that or I'm in a sad mood or a neutral mood uh, with somber colors. 
And so this is just a simple example. <clears throat> now, in reference to the chief example of a modern personal technology, when you take the smartphone, you look at the primary function, the utilitarian function is to communicate as well as to access content on the internet. But beyond that, there are clearly all kinds of practices suggesting that there are superfluous functions. For example, if you use the phone to text someone who's in the next room instead of using your voice, instead of walking to them. And there are immaterial functions. Of course, even the phone can be used as a fashion accessory, a status symbol, right? Look at my folding phones, which, which is costing $2,000, or look, I have the iPhone 16. And of course, even the smartphone as a technology has plateaued, right? What are really the difference between iPhone 13, 14, 15, now 16? Mm. But 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I don't know if you heard, but people would camp out of an Apple store for days with tents in order to be the first to get the newest iteration of the iPhone. Or they would sell their place in the line or they would get the phone to sell it to people who are desperate to have it, right? And then there are even non-utilitarian functions because you can use the phone to not to communicate but to manipulate communication or you can use the phone to avoid communication and interaction, right? I'm in class, I'm on the subway, I'm lost in my screen, which communicates, don't bother me, I don't want to talk to you, I'm doing something else, right? And maybe you're not doing anything interesting or you're just pretending to use your phone just to avoid a conversation or to avoid an encounter with someone. Of course, all of this can be applied to the automobile. I'm not going through the series for the automobile because this is what we'll do through the semester, okay? But keep in mind this kind of matrix. Other concepts that you find in that key presentation from week one are the fact that right from the earliest period in the commercial, commercial, commercialization uh, and distribution of the automobile, including the short stories we're talking today, you find the first manifestations of the phenomenon that we know now as tech evangelism. That is to say, people don't just use the automobile, they talk about it. And this is also something new, something modern, right? They talk about the qualities of the automobile, how exciting it is to own or to use an automobile in a very tribal way, right? You can recognize the people who are obsessed with this technology the same way that not now any longer, but perhaps five years ago, you might have seen people who belong to the iPhone tribe argue with people belonging to the Samsung slash Android tribe about the virtues of their phones and comparing and uh, entering into a kind of contest, competition, rivalry uh, about that. So during this period, in the language of the articles, sometimes the books themselves, you often find reference to the friends and enemies of the automobile, to the friends and foes of motoring or automobiling. Keep that in mind. And of course, the tribalization of the community of owners often happens through the sharing of the experience of speed, which is referred to with terms such as the bug, the intoxication, right? Meaning it is something that takes over your mind and your body and therefore you cannot but express your appreciation of that technology to everyone and try to convert people. They're talking about conversion with religious terms, 
right? And how do you convert someone to the automobile? You let them have a ride, especially a ride at high speed. And through this experience, then they become initiated to the technology. And again, it all goes back to the appropriation of religious uh, language, even evangelism, right? Is religious terminology. Finally, another big concept that will be analyzed in detail through readings and films, but especially readings this semester, is the adaptation of Darwin's theories to the use of the technology. You know how uh, during the 19th century, the origin of the species of Darwin not only became a popular scientific discovery, but it was also something that multiple intellectuals, journalists, politicians try to adapt to society. That is to say, the idea of the survival of the fittest, the idea that you can think of reality as a series of ecosystems, and within each ecosystem, those who have the right skills to survive will continue on, will have a future and ensure a future to their descendants, was being applied to everything, including the automobile. So we'll see how people, for example, in the famous chronicle of an endurance race from 1907, where the cars drove all the way from Beijing to Paris, about 10,000 miles, going across areas of Asia and Eastern Europe where people might not have seen a car before the uh, cars and crews from this race came by, the idea was, let's explore, let's use this as a test and see how people react. And let's imagine whether people from all areas of the world will be able to adapt to the ecosystems of the future where technologies such as the automobile, but also the plane, the radio, etc., will become dominant, will become prevalent, okay? And it's either evolve uh, or, or perish, right? So it is also a different way to look at the social competition, right? Whereby somebody who has the skills to drive and repair an automobile and can become a professional chauffeur, a driver for rich people owning a car, can advance can be endowed with social mobility, right? So it changes the rules in society. But many of those ideas uh, trickle down from interpretations or misinterpretations often, uh, excessive uh, simplifications of Darwin's theories. <coughs> Interestingly, the time when the automobile becomes popular between the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, is also the beginning of the history of feminism. And before it was called feminism, during the period in question when uh, the texts that we're reading uh, were composed, it was called the New Woman Movement. And this movement embraced technology because they saw early on how this technology eliminates the gender gap. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you can equally drive and operate this machinery. And in fact, the representation of women driving the automobile conveys ideas of empowerment, independence, gender parity, or even the opposite of the hierarchy. And we'll see that, for example, in the first bestseller, of the automobile literature, 1902, a good representative of the genre of motor romance. It's the story of a love that blossoms through proximity created by the automobile between a man and a woman who spend a lot of time together driving. In The Lightning Conductor, the female protagonist, Molly Randolph, uh, treats the driver as the male version of Cinderella. She's falling in love with the driver, yet she feels 
since she is the daughter of an American millionaire, that it's not at all appropriate for her to fall in love or even think of uh, engagement and marriage with a man who's a paid driver and therefore belongs to a lower class. And there is a barrier during this period. Yet she's drawn to this man exactly because he might be from allegedly from the lower classes, but the way he drives, the way he operates the vehicle makes him socially competitive. And the way he behaves himself shows that he has a kind of natural leadership, natural leadership being one of the most common trickle-down concepts from Darwin, meaning are you an aristocrat, a member of the upper classes, but do you have the natural skills that are associated with leadership, or you just inherited the name, the wealth of your family, but in fact, you belong to the bottom of the social hierarchy. And it's kind of a fairy tale uh, by the end of the story, she will find out that the chauffeur is in fact a British aristocrat who pretended to be a paid driver just to spend time with her while she was touring Europe with a chaperone, her Aunt Mary. And here we come to today's presentation and the texts that we're going to look at, analyze, discuss, and read this week. Um, as I said before, Charles Loomis published these three short stories in a booklet that I own uh, from 1907, but the original stories were published in magazines in 1900, 1901, and 1903. Uh, keep in mind that during this period, this was one of the best periods for magazines, especially magazines with short stories or long articles. People compared to today spent, of course, by, by this time, there were more people who were able to read, more people who could afford buying uh, magazines. Uh, but people, as their pastime, enjoyed, spent a lot of time on two activities. One, going to the theater, look, seeing plays, musicals, etc. And the other, and, and in fact, Pretty soon there was a musical on the automobile and plays on the automobile. The first musical in New York City was based on the Vanderbilt Cup races that took place on Long Island in that era. And the other activity was reading. And therefore, you could make a good living, you could sell a good story for good money. And this continued through the 1910s, 20s and 30s, especially because after the 1910s, a lot of these stories could be sold to the movie industry and the movie industry based their scripts often on popular short stories or novel. About thinking about the 1930s and, and 20s and 30s, for example, Francis Scott Fitzgerald, the author of The Great Gatsby, made a lot of money selling short stories, not just his novel. And then he himself tried to go, well, he went to Hollywood trying his uh, a, a new career at screenwriting and that, that fizzled and failed. So Charles Loomis was uh, born in Brooklyn, uh, went to a technical high school and then worked for several years. He was born in 1861, died in 1911, the last 20 years of his life between 1891 and 1911. He made a living writing short stories that he would sell to different magazines. And then every other year, more or less, he would collect the best of those short stories, put them together in a book and sell the book, as he did, for example, for the book entitled Araminta and the Automobile. What do we have to focus on? Keep in mind, that during this period and often later on, narratives about technology, including narratives about the technology of the automobile, follow this pattern. What is the arc of the story? You start with anticipation of the technology. 
right, before the technology comes into the life of the main characters or comes into the story, giving it a twist. And anticipation can have different formats, different forms. Uh, for example, it can be positive, it can be seduction, right? Meaning before I get the automobile, I'm looking forward. I'm thinking about my motivations or I'm, or I'm building up motivation to purchase, to make this big purchase, right? Because during this period, we're still talking about an automobile uh, being as expensive as a small apartment. The second phase after anticipation, which can be seduction or can be fear, right? Could be the signs of doom and disruption that will be brought forth by a new technology, as we will see in a science fiction example uh, soon, next week or the week after that. The second phase after the seduction or anticipation is the actual use of the technology. But that is often represented as either rapture or immersion. Rapture because you are taken over by the technology, you are intoxicated, you become obsessed with the use of the technology, you become addicted to the use of the technology. And again, now we're talking about the automobile, but it's easy to correlate to modern technologies, especially the smartphone. How addicted are you to the smartphone? How many hours can you go without your smartphone or days? How many hours can you go or days without the internet, right? And you know how in several countries there are popular camps where people go to detox from technology, where they have to spend two or three days without their phone, without access to the internet, right? Which represents a, a psychological hurdle for a lot of modern day users. I don't know if you're uh, one of those who has their phone, not even on the nightstand, but on the bed itself, under the pillow, right? So the second phase can be characterized for new technologies as rapture. You are completely taken into this, or it could be, in a more neutral sense, immersion in the technology. Meaning, whether you like it or not, you find yourself surrounded by the new technology and you have this exposure, this prolonged exposure to the technology with some good effects, some ill effects. Or it could be what I described before as captivity, meaning you experience a loss of control, which is not due to the fact that you're addicted to the technology, you're taken, you're drawn to it, but rather that the technology itself replaces the circumstances of your life and places you in a position where you have less control over your life, right? And again, you can try and imagine modern day example, for example, in the field of automation, where this loss of control can be experienced. For example, automated driving with its good and bad effect. And finally, the third stage for this kind of narratives, we said anticipation or seduction is the first phase, immersion, rapture, loss of control, captivity in the second phase. The third is rejection or adoption of the technology. At the end of the adventure, have been exposed to, having experienced the transformation caused by the technology, I decide to separate myself from it. And interestingly enough, there are plenty of stories where this happens during the early 1900s. So it's not always a rosy representation of the technology. There are stories where a couple returns the automobile and says, nope, not for us, never uh, we're not going to use it any longer. Modern films about technologies, especially science fiction or thrillers, where you have evil characters with incredible, incredibly powerful technologies, can have the equivalent of this separation or rejection in the form of self-destruction, right? Think of traditional 007 films, but even the more recent ones are not different, even No Time to Die 
is different in that regard, where at the very end, the base where the evil guy and its evil network organization operated with incredibly advanced technology, either is self-distracted so that it won't fall into the hands of other people or destroyed uh, by the good guys, as in the case of No Time to Die. And, of course, the other option, rejection, Distraction is one option. The other option for this kind of narrative for the conclusion is adoption. So now we go on and our life has changed compared to the beginning because we've embraced this kind of technology. The underlying theme for all of these stories is consumption, consumerism, the culture of consumption in a new modern society with some distinctive features, qualities that we recognize. For example, who's supposed to buy a luxury item for this time, such as the automobile? Well, anybody, even people who cannot afford it, right? The same way that during this period in the marketing of fashion, who's supposed to buy fine clothes? Just members of the upper classes who can afford them? No. Even someone from lower classes will have a nice pair of gloves, a nice tie, a nice hat. One, because they can afford more, or a nice suit, a nice, nice dress. But they want to partake of the culture of consumerism where nice items, nice products, luxury products build up your identity, make you the focus of the attention of the people around you, right? And again, this is true to this day. Who is buying those expensive folding phones that cost $2,000? Just the people who make 100,000? No, even people who in theory could not afford it, but they want to be seen and they, then they find some justification for this purchase. Okay, so the three stories are about three couples. And this, in, this is interesting from the point of view of uh, the idea of consumerism, right? Because what are, what are the roles of the husband and the wife in the purchase of a big ticket item such as the automobile? Is it the husband to decide? Do they need permission from the wife? Do they decide together? Or... And this is a development you will see through the literature going on closer to our time. Is the family not a unit when it comes to purchasing items, even big ticket items? And, and therefore, is the family disgregated into separate consumers who want what they want and will buy what they want? So look for this interesting dynamic. In the first story, we find... A suburban couple from New Jersey, living in New Jersey, and he's commuting to the city. No name is given for the husband who uh, narrates the story. And the wife's name is Araminta, which gives them the title to the book itself. I'll tell you the stories later. I just want to introduce the characters, the couples. Uh, they're an upper middle class couple, okay? They're not, they live in a suburban environment, but they don't have the fanciest house in the neighborhood, etc. Martha and John are instead an exurban couple. Uh, they live in a place that cannot be identified. There are no references to the name of the town where they live, could be made up. Uh, but they still live close enough to a big city, which could be New York City, even in this case, let's say 30 miles, 40 miles. Okay, so not close enough to be commuters. And they're richer. They have servants. They have horses and carriages. They have a nicer house, much larger house. Finally, Annette and Orville are a soon-to-be married couple. 
they're falling in love with each other in New York City. Orville lives in New York City. He's a writer of a new genre because among modern things that get introduced during this era and already at the end of the 19th century is the so-called self-help literature. And this is what Orville is publishing and this is in the form of articles and books and this is how he made his fortune and therefore now he's young still young rich enough and he's about to get married and he falls in love with Annette who's who's from the mid a young woman from the midwest visiting her aunt in New York City and she's supposed then to go to Paris and She's visiting exactly because she is the age of marriage and going to New York City to visit her quite rich aunt who lives on 5th Avenue and 48th Street in the heart of Manhattan. She can get introduced to potential uh, fiancés. Okay? So, and, and there is always, of course, a car. Uh, the purchase of a car and the use of a car in the first two stories and... Uh, an adventure with a taxi cab, an electric taxi cab in the third story. So let's talk uh, more closely, more in detail about the first story with Araminta and the husband. We find in this story the phase of the anticipation of the purchase of the car, where we explore the motivations of this couple. The motivations are stronger for the husband, but there is some drive to this purchase on the part of Araminta as well. Uh, in the first two pages, we learn that the husband is working in the city, commuting by train. He doesn't enjoy the commuting because he says people, the people who commute every day and they know each other, they're in the same trains. Oftentimes during that period, people try to get together in the same car so that they could talk with the same groups. Um, he doesn't enjoy that because he says people on the train going to the city are either playing cards, and he doesn't like that, or reading newspapers, newspaper articles, and talking about politics, and he doesn't enjoy that. So he'd rather use the car because the car is the perfect companion, not too talkative, guarantees the peace and quiet is looking for together with the safety of getting to the destination. Besides that, we learn how they, this couple, live in a neighborhood where all the other neighbors are still using horses, very happy with horse and carriages. And this will make this young couple famous in a way, right? People will look at them because they're different. Why are they different? Because they have purchased the automobile. And that's where the motivation of the wife is mentioned. She enjoys this idea of being different from the neighbors, having something they don't have. They might have a better, more elegant, larger house, but they don't have a car, which is a newer product. So... A lot of references to the culture of consumerism, right? You don't buy something because you need it. You buy something to create a new lifestyle, change the style of my commute. Not the results, right? Point A, point B, doesn't change much. And the culture of consumerism means also I'm building up my social persona through the purchase of this item. And what happens? To this couple, the car, as they used to do, is delivered to them. So you have to imagine that at some point John went to an agency, uh, either that was the shop of a dealer or a shop where they would sell different brands, various brands, uh, to try the car. But the demos of the car were done with drivers. When you went during this period to buy a car, they wouldn't let you drive the car. You, you wouldn't know how to drive, especially if it was your, your first car. And um, the, the car sellers 
would rely on demo drivers, would take you for a ride, and then you would pick a car. The car would then be delivered to your house, but after the delivery, they would not leave you alone with a car if it was your first car. The delivery man was also a trained driver who would spend two or three hours with you, showing you how to drive the car and how to do basic repairs, spark plugs, tires, um, lubri lubrication, because you had to add oil frequently with these cars in various parts. It was not just adding oil to the oil tank. No, you had to lubricate parts of the wheels, parts of the suspensions, etc. So what happens at this point in the story is that John is already feeling more powerful because he has a new car. So he says, listen, I don't need anything from you. It's looking down at the delivery man, right? And in fact, there is an illustration. I've included an illustration in the readings. And the delivery man is represented as a low-class people person. John says, good man, I don't need you. All I need is experience. As soon as I drive the car, the experience of driving, of using it, will teach me how to become a good driver. Okay? And he sends him away. Then he presents the car to the uh, wife. And here you have the progress of the seduction. The car liked, uh, is, is liked by both. And even the wife says, let's go. Let's go out. Let's try it. Which means, let's go out and be seen in our new products, in our neighborhood, and then go into the next village. Incidentally, she had just come back from Paramus, from shopping, so consumerism is mentioned several times. Before they both go out with the car, the, the, the husband, sorry, the husband uh, says, let's not uh, uh, rush, let me just try it around the house and then you can jump in. But when he turns the car on, he proceeds to destroy the barn where the car was stored, destroys the veranda of the house, destroys the fence of the house because he has no control over the car. Nonetheless, the wife, Araminta, decides to get on the car and they go out on the street. There, they travel towards the next village, then they try to come back and they'll have one issue after the other. They will have several accidents, for example, an accident with their own family doctor who's driving a horse and carriage like most doctors in 1900 and the doctor will find himself catapulted on their car and then he'll have to jump off. By the end of the story, they are not able to return home. The car is clearly going to crash into a greenhouse made of glass and Araminta will be the first one to jump off the car and then the husband will do the same. So this is a story of seduction, clearly, of the technology, and then exposure to the technology in a situation where the users experience loss of control or captivity. They are hostage to the car, which is a theme to all of the three stories and particularly the third one, okay? We don't know about the third phase. There is no third phase in this narrative. So we don't know whether the couple will separate themselves from the product, reject the technology, or adopt the technology. The story ends just with a joke, with a line by the husband that says, who knew that uh, the, the most expensive part of uh, the automobile was not getting on the automobile, but stopping the automobile? because they've caused so much distraction. The second story, The Deception of Martha Tucker, is even more uh, strange. So we have a rich couple, as I said, and the husband, John, tells you that how the issue is not so much that uh, his wife, Martha, loves horses. It's just that she doesn't like cars. She hates them. She is afraid of them. And he says, <coughs> I could buy the automobile and then I could ride on the automobile by myself. 
but we are a close couple. We spend time together. We do a lot of things together. So I'd rather not buy the automobile without the consent, the full consent of my wife. So he has visited places in New York City, seen cars, and he comes up with this plan. One day, his wife has a problem with her eyes. Uh, could be poison ivy, something like that. She gets her eyes deeply irritated, and the doctor prescribes the use, which was customary at that time, in a case such as this, of smoky lenses, dark lenses that would prevent light from getting to the eye that is already irritated. So, and again, you will see one of the illustrations in the book where the wife has these very dark glasses. So she can see very little. She's not blind, but she can see the shapes. Uh, she, she cannot see all the details. At this point, the husband, since the wife will have to endure those dark glasses with thick lenses for a few days, comes up with this bizarre plan. Goes back to the city, purchases a car, an electric car, presumably. Then goes to a store that sells equipment for horse riding. Of course, a lot of people in the middle and upper classes were still riding horses, people who lived in Manhattan. And outside of this store, to signal the kind of products they're selling, they have this beautiful wooden horse. And he says, I would like to purchase a horse such as that, but one where the legs can move. And we'll put wheels, we'll connect the legs to the wheels so that the, the, the legs can move as, as the, this kind of cart is pushed. Goes back to the people who sold him the cart, the car, the automobile, and says, I want two poles attached in front of the car. I forgot to mention how he ordered a car that can be driven from the back. And I'll show you. Uh, again, fairly bizarre examples of this, which was a requirement for people who wanted to transition from a carriage with horses to the automobile without disruptions. It says, I want these two poles because in case the automobile fails, I can use them to have the car pulled by real horses. He doesn't tell them about his plan. So, he puts together this contrivance. It's a car with a driver on top, behind the passengers. In front of it, they attach this fake horse with wheels and with legs that will move when the, the, the horse is pushed by the car so that not only you see movement in the horse, but you also hear the hooves, you hear the horse galloping, trotting. And the horse is beautiful, beautifully made, has long hair, so it looks like a horse. And John tells Martha, let's go out. I bought you a gift. It's a new carriage. We'll go out, the two of us, but James, our coachman, will be with us. In fact, is not their coachman, is the man from the dealership. And since the wife has these very dark lenses, she believes she's looking at a carriage and horses, right? The horse has fake air that she can touch. She get on top and it feels like a carriage. And I'll show you cars during that period that were exactly like a carriage, a traditional carriage. And they go out, right? And she's impressed. So this horse is very quick. This ride is very comfortable very quiet. She's also surprised how they're speeding, but the rhythm, the pace of the noise made by the horse hooves, by the fake horse, is the same, right? Because it's a mechanical horse. And he comes up with explanations to justify that oddity. But then, once again, after the seduction, we know how the husband is seduced by the idea of the automobile. He wants this desperately. Seduction on the part of the wife comes with a 
comfort of the ride, how this is different from anything, any kind of carriage she has experienced before. So things appear to go well. He thinks that at the end, he'll say, surprise, this is an automobile. Did you enjoy it? So we'll get one. No, things go wrong. They experience loss of control again. They become hostage to the technology. The car gains speed, but the driver is not able to control it well, and then the driver falls off from his high position behind the passengers, falls off, and now John is in front. The, the automobile, in this case, has a, a bar to steer it. He tries to maneuver it behind himself. He is able to avoid walls once, twice, but then they crash. Before they crash, he tells her, his wife to jump into a pond so that she will not get hurt. And he finds himself on the ground as well, goes to rescue his wife. And he finds the driver who's running after them. And he says, OK, good man, take the, the, the vehicle, bring it back to the dealership. Uh, I'm not going to keep it. Uh, because he thinks that at this point his plan has not worked. Instead, the wife says, look, I'm not, we, we'd better buy an automobile because I've just seen how dangerous horses are. She hasn't gotten any clue that this was a mechanical horse and therefore she has enjoyed the, she, she now comes to consider the idea of getting an automobile and they will enter a new life. So in this case, the third part is hinted to is adoption, right? So you have seduction, you have loss of control, as well as exposure to the ride, to the technology, and then adoption, the third part of the narrative arc. Now, you may find it bizarre, and in fact, it was an actual invention. Somebody in 1899 came up with the idea of attaching to a car. Now, this looks like a carriage, but is one of several examples of traditional carriages converted with an engine in the back. So this is a vehicle, a self-profiled vehicle with an internal combustion engine. And somebody said, I'll, I will sell you a fake horse in front so you can keep it in front of you because it will be soothing. You will not be afraid of the automobile. It will be just the same experience as every day uh, before you purchase the automobile when you were on a, on a carriage, okay? And you can find out more from the links. This is from the actual patent. This got patented. So this was the component, as, as I said before, initial cars, you could buy just a chassis and then have someone install a body. If you think in those terms, then your body could include this with a fake horse in front of you just to reassure the consumer, don't be afraid. It's just like any ride, as safe as riding with a horse. Final story, Annette and Orville. I said before, they're both young. Of course, Annette is younger. Orville is a successful writer in New York, a bachelor. And they've met each other when Annette, a few months, I think three months earlier, came to New York City to visit her Rich and Mrs. Martin. They're falling in love with each other, but they're not sure. Uh, she feels that as a woman, cannot come out and say, I'm in love with you. She's waiting for him to move in that direction, to declare his love. He's afraid. She, he, he cannot read uh, the situation well. However, at the beginning of the story, he gets, it's almost Christmas, it's Christmas, uh, and um, he receives a, a note from Mrs. Martin who says, look, Annette is about to leave. She will go to Paris, and maybe she'll encounter someone in Paris. Maybe she will get proposed in Paris, right? Of course, she's not going to Paris by herself. She, she's going to visit friends, etc." So the letter communicates to Orville, make a move. This is your last chance. Make your proposal. 
And therefore, Orville goes out, buys a ring, while people are buying Christmas gifts, he buys a ring. Then he is being invited to dinner on the day of Christmas. However, going back to his house from his club, from his circle, he slips on an orange peel, falls and hurts badly his ankle. So he has, they, they tell you exactly, he lives in Lower Manhattan. He has 25 blocks to walk. Clearly he cannot walk. His ankle is swollen. So in fact, he cannot even put a pair of shoes. He has one shoe and a slipper on the hard foot. And he calls a cab, a taxi cab, an electrical taxi cab. As I said, already in 1898, 1899, hundreds of electric taxi cabs could be found operating in New York City. The taxi cab arrives, he gets on top, and again, I'll show you then the pictures of the actual vehicles. And, and again, it's a situation where the passenger is in front in a cabin, the driver is on top in the back. They get close to the house of Mrs. Martin, where they're already waiting for him, and the car cannot stop. The driver says, there is something wrong with the car, I cannot stop it. And don't worry though, because the car has been used, and as I mentioned, these taxi cabs would work with batteries that would be replaced at their hub. At the end of their rides, they would go by the hub and once in a while replace the batteries with freshly charged batteries. He says, don't worry, eventually the battery will discharge, will just drive around the block, and as soon as the battery is discharged, you can step down. Orville would like to jump, but there is liability, right? The driver says, I don't want to be sued by you, because in your condition, you will jump, fall again, and then we'll have to pay. And so they go around. And Orville is annoyed by this, right? Because he was counting on using the opportunity of the dinner, the time spent at dinner, before the dinner also, to measure the attitudes of Annette, to see whether it's in fact a good idea or not to propose at the end of the night. So, he's going around, it's getting late, the people inside the house don't know what happened to Orville, and they initiate an interesting conversation about technologies. All the ways you can die with modern technologies. Cars, steamships, elevators, all kinds of horrible deaths can be experienced with these new contraptions. Finally, upstairs, they realize that someone is calling because every time Orville goes around, he's, he's trying to call out to the people in the house. So they all come down, they wait for the car to come by again, and they realize that in fact, yes, it is Orville, and Orville communicates that it's captive to the car, that the car has no brakes, cannot stop, and uh, he's awfully hungry, he even tells them that. And so they don't know what to do. They're all there, including Annette. Joe, one of the guests, jumps on, decides to jump on the passing vehicle, this car, electric taxi cab in New York, would have been driving at a speed of 10 to 15 miles per hour. So not impossible. He jumps on the vehicle with soup. And so the, the poor Orville can have some soup and they talk about the situation. He learns that Annette is worried, which is good on, from his point of view. If she's worried, she cares about him. Okay, but if he cannot get out of the vehicle, how can he propose? So jo Joe says, don't worry, he steps out of the vehicle, jumps out of the vehicle the next time around, goes to talk to Annette. And Annette, who's indeed a new woman, more courageous, even physically courageous, strong, decides to jump herself on the car. So she's good enough and brave enough to jump on the car, bring in the entree, that's the excuse, brings the entree to Orville, and they talk, 
And quickly, Orville realizes that it's time for his proposal. And exactly while the vehicle is slowing down and about to stop in front of the house, he proposes. And he says, promises, well, as soon as my foot, my ankle has healed, we'll go to Paris for our honeymoon. And therefore, they get married. Even here, well, here in this story, you don't really have the seduction of the car. It's just that there is no alternative for the protagonist. And then the protagonist experiences both the exposure to the technology and the loss of control being hostage to the technology. However, it ends up, uh, the technology ends up being the instrument for his future, right? So it has a transformative effect. And these are illustrations from the magazine where this story was first published. This is the taxi cab we're referring to. Look how different it is, but more similar to coaches and carriages used to transport passengers. You see the driver on top and a front cabin which opens this way where the passengers, one or two passengers, uh, can ride. In the back, you see the angel, Cupid, right? To signify that the car is the instrument of this new love and here you see the shoe and the slipper to remind you that he fell and cannot wear two shoes because he has a badly swollen foot and ankle this is another illustration where you can see not only the taxi cab but the passenger in front <coughs> of course the batteries and engine would be here in the back and you see the kids following the car. The representation of the kids goes back to what I was telling you before about friends and enemies of the automobile. What about the kids in the streets? Are they friends or enemies? They can be either. They can be chasing cars or asking, begging drivers to give them a ride. Or they can be throwing rocks at the cars. We have plenty of examples, especially in rural areas. And this is Joe with a pot full of soup, jumping on the vehicle, so you have a view of the front of the vehicle. This is Orville. This is the conclusion, where you see that Annette is playing the part of the shy woman, but don't forget that Annette took the initiative of jumping on the car, so she's not that kind of traditional woman. She's very much a new woman already. And this is a pro the proposal, would you be willing to go to Paris on a bridal trip? And these are pictures of similar vehicles, right? You see here the doors to access the front, the platform where you step to enter the vehicle, the very tall position of the driver, which was similar to carriages, and you see the place for the engine and the batteries. This is even closer to the illustrations from the magazine, especially the wheels, but very similar in terms of technology. But there, are, there were plenty of similar examples of traditional carriages with their design converted to transform them into self-propelled vehicles. Of course, you have rubber tires to make the ride more comfortable, but the suspensions are the same. You see an engine here in the back, and once again, you see the front part reserved to the passengers and the driver sitting back very tall with this time a steering wheel and limited visibility. But again, we're talking about vehicles driving 10, 15 miles per hour, 20 at most, right? So you don't need much. This is yet another example. You can see how close to a traditional carriage this is. And once again, you have the tall position for the drivers and the handlebar. You see there is a handlebar to control the steering and the big box for the engine and the batteries. Again, often these transformations were electric, but some of them had a steam engine, others an internal combustion engine. This is electric anyway. But it's exactly like a carriage. Look at this, 1906 and there's still, or 1907. This is Rhode Island. They're still making 
even in 1907, they're still making the, the Ford is working on the prototype of the Model T, but they're still making these very traditional carriages. This time, the driver sits in front, but it's very much like a carriage, only with an electrical engine and rubber tires, right? 